Thank you. All right. How many of you have ever done threat modeling before? Almost no one. A couple people. Half hands, sort of. OK, perfect. All right. Take a look at this castle I have here. This is called a Mott and Bailey castle. Mott means hill. Bailey means low land underneath um, or flat ground. Um, but take a look at it and, and yell out, what are some of the things you see as advantages for defending this castle? Height. Height. Anything else? Observability. What's that? Observability. Observability. They can see all the way around. Anything else? Water. And there's water around it. And actually, we'll get another shot in just a second. There's a moat going around it. Single entry point. How about disadvantages? Single entry point, it's made of wood, so susceptible to fire. What else? Stairs. The stairs, how is that a hard, uh, how does that make it harder to defend? The attackers can get up easier, right? You're giving them an entry point, right, rather than having to climb the hill. All right, this is that same location, and that's the mott right there. Does this change the way you look? Like, what, what else do you see now that plays into whether you could attack this easier or defend it easier? Sparse. Lots of space around it. There's no trees encroaching on it, right? You get a good view of the moat around it. You can see. The big thing is that no one's going to be able to come up on this and rush it very quickly to try to gain access. The walls are high. They're going to have to do something to attack it from a distance at first, probably, because they have good visibility. They can shoot down arrows at them. They do have a problem with it could be burned fairly easily. They also have a town to protect, right? This area down here, right? This area here. Looks like there's people living there. And they'd certainly be susceptible to attack. There's nothing you could do about that, right? The, the Mott and Bailey Castle here is not near big enough to bring townspeople in and keep them in there. All right. All right. Consider it compared to this one. What are some of the differences here? How could we protect this one better? What are some of the advantages? It's made of stone, not wood. Surrounded on a couple sides, at least, by water. Multiple layers of walls, right? If you get past the first wall, you're not in the, in the inside. There's still another wall to get through, another wall. The classic Merlins on top of the walls here, the, the, the gaps for archers to hide behind or people to hide behind so they can throw things down and still have cover. Right? The rocks around it, it's going to make it very tough to just pull up a boat right alongside and try to gain access to those, hills, to those uh, walls. Right? OK, one more here. Oh, so a lot of times we'll talk about think like an attacker when we talk about trying to do threat modeling to figure out like how would we attack this. But the reality is in threat modeling, it's often considered harmful for a couple reasons. One is if we were attackers, we wouldn't be doing the threat modeling. We'd be doing the attacking. So we don't really know how to, how to think like an attacker. We also, if we try to guess we're going to pigeonhole ourselves into the ways we think about certain things. Right? We're not going to think about all the different ways that could be attacked. We're going to think about the one that's obvious to us, a non-attacker. Um, one of the things we'll do, and we'll talk about this later, with threat modeling is we're going to break down the pieces and look at each component and then figure out how we can get in through that. Right? And then we'll assess the risk that's involved. All right, here's one more. Everyone recognize this one? All right. What's different about this in the last couple we've shown? It keeps people in. We're no longer trying to keep people out. We're trying to keep people in. And that's changing the situation dramatically, right? Right now, we might still want to keep people from accessing it easily to get you know, escaping prisoners help arriving. But turns out on Alcatraz Island, there's only one place that a boat can really approach very closely, and that's the the uh, dock right there that's, that's right in the front. Uh, every other side is so many rocks and everything. Um, escaping is tough. It's surrounded by water. The water is shark infested, right? It's not an easy trip out, even if you manage to get out of the jail, out of the cells, 
out of the building, down the hill, which only has one way down, and then onto some ship, boat, jump in the water and swim it for it, right? Okay, so every situation here has been really different. If we were to talk about locking doors, right, is, is what we're trying to do, we're trying to lock a door, we're not really trying to lock a door, our goal is keeping unauthorized people out, right? That's really our goal here. And there's different levels, different approaches we can take depending on how much effort, time, how many resources we have, right, that we want to put into it. Let's start with the, let's say the lowest level, right? A Cheeto level of security. Doors closed, it's working right now, right? Maybe something a little bit more typical for locking a door, a regular lock, very nice because if you're trying to control access, access is given to whoever has a key, right? People who don't have keys, for the most part, don't have access, at least not convenient access. We could get into biometrics, right? Handprint scanning, right? Keypad to put in a code, right? Or it could be even more serious, right? Vault doors, right? You could really lock people out. I think it's pretty easy to see that the types of things we might consider using the Cheeto lock for are not the same types of applications we're going to be using the vault doors for. Right, those are radically different use cases. All right. Above the entrance of this, you'll see the Scottish national motto, which means no one provokes me without, with, no one provokes me with impunity. All right. The goal of the castles here is to keep people from just walking in unopposed and attacking them, right? Um, when we look at security, around a software system, we're gonna look pretty much at the same thing. We're just trying to stop people from just walking in, grabbing all our data, shutting down our system, blowing up our, blowing up our servers, whatever the case is. Right? There's a couple questions we really have to look at when we decide what type of effort and what type of measures we're gonna put into place. First, what are we protecting? Right? Is this something that the Cheeto is good enough for? Or are we looking for vault doors? Why are we protecting it? What is someone going to gain if they get in, right? What, what's the impact to us if something does happen? How might it be compromised? How could they gain access? How could an attacker get what they need out of this? What happens if we fail to protect it? What's the impact to us? And finally, how will we react and respond and move on if it does get attacked? Um, Adam Shostak, I'm going to show his book later, he, write, he writes a lot on threat modeling. He's one of the people who teaches a ton of threat modeling courses. Um, he phrases it as the four question frame for threat modeling. It's similar. What are we working on? What can go wrong? What are we going to do about it? And did we do a good job? Right? And if you think about it, this is a lot like a lot of things we do in software development where we have a feedback loop, right? We consider what we're going to do. We consider the, the failure cases. We figure out how to, how to address those. And then we use feedback to see, you know, did we do enough? Do we need to do more? Do we do too much? Do we invest too much in this? Should we not do it later? All right? And then we showed lots of different ways to attack something. Again, the scale from the Cheeto to the vault door. Even if you have high tech, sometimes you know, implementation can sink you, right? Or maintenance can sink you, right? Even if this one is actually a lot more clever than we could guess, I think uh, we know that there's not that many combinations it really could be. All right, so let's look back. This is a different Mott and Bailey castle. Um, some of the advantages of this particular castle, this style, was it took limited effort. You had to find a hill. You usually didn't build the hill, you found the hill. You cleared the land around it, which gave you lumber. So you had lumber available to build the walls, the, the castle itself, right? Um, and it didn't take a lot of experience or a lot of expertise. This was something you could send a bunch of people out saying, hey, we're gonna set up a Mott and Bailey castle here. There's the hill, cut down the trees, 
build up the castle. We don't have a castle architect coming. We're not going to have months of planning meetings. There's not going to be long design sessions here. Put up a fort, put up a big wall, put spikes on the end. Right? It was just enough for what they needed at the time. Right? Now, this is probably like an outpost. Right? Again, we're not hiding uh, townsfolk in here. We're just protecting the surrounding area. In fact, if an attacking force came, we'd probably say, town folk, run off, get out of here. We don't want to have to try to protect you too. We're going to try to hold this. So they just can't get past us, right? Now, if we had more time, maybe we'd do more. In fact, this happens to be a rec recreation on the grounds of another castle, right, which was obviously built much more sturdy, right, built with brick. But this one has a lot of problems with it. In fact, chances are this is just the way it's been converted after, uh, over years into a residence. But you see big windows, lots of glass. It's at river level here, so there's water around it, but flooding is going to be a problem if you need to get heavy equipment in to try to attack it with. There's a convenient, uh, convenient river to bring those all in. So all of this is things you're thinking about when you're doing what I like to call back of the napkin threat modeling, right? You're going through this, and we do this every day in, in our normal lives. We approach a street, we decide we're gonna cross it, we're gonna look both ways, we're gonna walk across, right? We take a lot of things into account. Is this a busy street? Is traffic coming? Is this a residential street, in which case I'm probably crossing wherever I feel like it? Is this a city street, where maybe I need, feel the need to cross at a crosswalk, right? Do I have anybody with me? Maybe a small child. I'm going to hold their hand. I'm going to walk across with them. I'm going to be extra careful. Is it a one-way street? Do I need to check both ways? Do I need to really, really check both ways? Because you know, who knows who could be coming down the wrong way? But chances are I'm going to give it a cursory glance, the wrong, someone coming down the wrong way. Right? All that is is threat, threat modeling. That's threat modeling and risk analysis. I'm trying to decide what are my risks here? What could go wrong? How much effort do I need to put into making sure those things don't happen to me? A lot of this plays into the idea of zero trust. Now, I'm from outside of DC. We do a lot of government consulting, federal government consulting. And one of the things that came out in the last few years, Executive Order 14028. Has anybody heard of it? All right, anybody who's ever had to do with S-bombs, that, that's a very popular piece of it. Another po popular piece of it is zero trust architectures. And 14.028 is the executive order to improve the nation's cybersecurity. And one of the reasons working as a federal government contractor that we look into it is because now there's an order. That means there's money behind taking up any of the efforts to try to improve these things. But they talk a lot about zero trust. And zero trust has a couple assumptions. It's a big buzzword. But it really just means a couple of things. Here are some of the assumptions that go around it. The entire enterprise private network is not considered an implicit trust zone. Just because you're inside does not mean you're safe to deal with. Devices on the network may not be owned or configurable by the enterprise. And no resource is inherently trusted, which is really all three saying the same thing. We're not trusting them just because you happen to be on our network, right? Couple more things. Not all enterprise resources are enterprise owned infrastructure, and remote enterprise subjects and assets cannot fully trust their local network connection. This could be someone on your VPN, it could be someone sitting at Starbucks, it could be someone that just found a random Wi Fi hotspot to connect to and they're going to do your company's business on, right? So the first three are don't trust anything on the inside network, the next two are don't trust anything in the outside network, and then the last one, assets and workflows moving between enterprise and non-enterprise infrastructure should have a consistent security policy and posture, have a process for dealing with things moving back and forth. That's all that zero trust means, right? We're just not saying, hey, you're on our network so we can implicitly trust you. And that plays into all our trust, all our, I'm sorry, all of our, um, our, our threat modeling, all of our risk assessment, right, is that anybody could be an attacker, no matter where they are, even if I trust the person, they may be compromised, they may be on a bad network, any of that. All right, take another look at this. This is a, a Crusader's castle built in Syria. Anyone want to yell out some of the advantages this one has over the ones we've seen before? It's a lot bigger, 
multiple walls again. It's on the top of a big hill. Plenty of visibility all the way around. I mean, we can't see the backside, but I think it's pretty safe to say they can see an opposing force coming from very, very far away, right? But we also know that this probably took a whole lot more time to set up than those Mott and Bailey castles. They had to decide that it was worth doing it, that the investment in time and resources made this a valuable resource. Now, a lot of the things we've talked about with all the castles we've looked at have been that um, there's, a, there's some commonality, right? Good visibility, they're up on a hill, hard to approach, multiple walls, or at least a hard to breach wall, right? Stone, preferably, the harder material is gonna make it harder to, to get through, right? A lot of commonality. So, what if we just came up with a list of ways to attack a castle or defend a castle, right? We just, if we knew what all the ways they were gonna attack were, and we just said, hey, there's these, let's say, top 10, different ways they might want to protect it, right? And we put them in some sort of order, right? And it's, it's the top 10 ordered ways of attacking castles or, you know, we didn't even do all castles. Let's just say strong places, right? If we had this top 10, would this be enough? Could we just say, hey, everybody just protect against those top 10 and you're done, right? You've got all the major ways. No one's going to be attacking with that 11th. Right, does that make any sense? Of course, the answer is no, right? The whole point of doing threat modeling, the reason threat modeling is important is that what it's going to do is look at our environment, right? Alcatraz Island versus the Crusader's Castle. We're trying to keep people out, we're trying to keep people in. Is this very, very valuable stuff that we're protecting? We need a vault door? This is something that Cheeto is good enough for, right? Just keep people away, I just want the door to stay closed and not blow open, right? So threat modeling is all about coming up with this list of what's important in my situation right now for this system. It may change over time, it's certainly gonna change over environments, it may change over different systems. Um, another big castle, right? Nice high walls, way up on a hill, um, this is the same view, or a different view of the same castle. You can see there's obviously one way that people have been approaching, right? But one of the other things I actually like about this picture is you can kind of see these look like original windows, right? Probably they don't look like they'd be easy to go through for an attacker to come in, but certainly I could be firing arrows out of it. On the other hand, this window is very different. It's a glass window, it's huge. It turns out that this was converted to a residence and presumably they wanted some extra light in their house, right? So over time, they made some modifications. Those modifications changed the security posture of this castle. Now, if this happened in modern days, then they're probably less likely to worry about attacking hordes, right? But someone had to make that decision. Someone had to look at, hey, over time, we no longer need those narrow arrow slit windows. Now we can afford to have big windows and let lots of light in because we're just not getting attacked. I'm not worried about that anymore. All right. How about this one? This is a monastery in Greece. Anybody ever see the James Bond movie? Um, what am I thinking of now? For your eyes only? All right. I actually think this picture is, this is not the monastery that was in that, but this picture was taken from that monastery, right? Very different type of setup to protect this, right? It's on the top of a hill, which we've seen before, right? But you notice no outside walls. Why not? They, they didn't need them, right? There's just no way they're afraid of someone coming up to their walls and getting in that way. There's one path up, and you just have to be able to protect that pass. You can protect that pass. No one's getting anywhere near the monastery itself. Right? So it all depends on the likelihood of something happening and what you're trying to protect inside. When we do actual threat modeling, we tend to do some sort of graph or something to decide how important something is, how much effort I'm going to put into it, resources, time, whatever. 
It, it may be three by three, it may be two by two, it may be four by two, whatever. But it's usually some sort of graph like this or chart like this, even if we don't actually draw it out, that's likelihood. How, how possible or probable is this that's going to happen? Going anywhere from this is certainly going to happen because I'm a bank and I have secure data inside my system versus, you know, chances are no one's even pushing on the door. That Cheeto is probably going to be enough, right? And so it's quote unquote never going to happen. And the impact of something going wrong. Even if it's unlikely, it's more serious if it's a serious catastrophic impact versus an insignificant or at least a quote unquote insignificant impact. Now a lot of times you'll get those impacts and likelihoods wrong, but at least you're making some sort of decision how much effort you're going to put into it, right? And so in, in a graph like this, some people label them high, medium, low as far as importance. Some people put some sort of uh, color scale like this on it. It might be something very even spread out, like the top corner is red, the bottom corner is green. It could be skewed a little bit, so there's a lot more that we're going to consider serious. May again, maybe we're a bank, government agency. We have customer data that we're trying to protect. There's actually some valuables in there. We can't afford even the hint of something going wrong. Maybe this is just a personal website. I don't want the whole thing hacked and make me look like an idiot, but frankly, unless it's likely to happen and really serious, I'm not putting any effort into it. But it's some sort of range like that. And that's what's going to help you decide, is this worth protecting? Is this worth putting a lot of effort into it or just a little? Do I need to go through all the trouble of installing vault doors or biometrics or is a master lock enough? All right. How about this one? How likely is it that someone could breach the Great Wall of China? Presumably not today. Let's talk about back when it was actively in use. Could this actually keep people out? A couple people shaking their heads. No. Right? First of all, it's way, way too long. It wasn't manned by professional soldiers. Um, susceptible to bribery, susceptible to walls just falling down, people coming across where there was no one watching at the time, right? This was a deterrence. It was trying to say, hey, here's the edge of my empire. No one comes through here without at least slowing down to get in, right? Right over the wall of the Edinburgh Castle, right? No one attacks with impunity, right? And to slow people down when they're coming in. If you were trying to get the Mongol hordes in, chances are they'd be slowed down here enough that you'd at least have someone say, hey, looks like we got an army coming. We should react to that. This is going to give us time to react. Right? I kind of look at it as the old version of this. Anybody old enough to remember the club? Right? Locks the steering wheel. Very, very easy to get around, which is just cut the steering wheel, cut a, cut a slice in the steering wheel, and it pulls right out. But that wasn't the point. If you had a club and a similar car next to you in the parking lot did not, they were the ones more likely to get in, right? In software, we'd think of this as, hey, if you're susceptible to the latest and greatest uh, script kitty uh, scripts running against your system, you're probably going to get hacked. If you've just cleaned up enough to prevent that, well, at least you're not going to get hacked by someone who's just doing a drive-by, just wants to see if they can get in and just looking for anybody. You're not going to stop a state actor. You're not going to stop someone who's really, really set on trying to get in. But at least you might slow them down, right? All right. We talked about trying to figure out what our threats are, how important it is, what type of effort we're going to put into protecting it based on is it likely, is it the impact catastrophic, the whole goal of this is to address those threats, to come up with a plan at least to address them. First, we might mitigate the threat, make it harder for someone to take advantage of it, right? The club, the Great Wall of China. We could eliminate the threats. This probably means eliminating some features, right? So part of you may want to think about Yagni, you ain't going to need it, right? If it's, if it's a feature you don't need, if you don't need, to allow people from the field, let's say, to get into your system and do admin steps like resetting the database and wiping all customer data, don't put that feature in. You've eliminated a threat there just by not having the feature. 
transfer the threat, especially in our cloud days now, where so many things run on cloud and we use cloud services to do things, this is making it somebody else's problem. Put it in the federal government, they call this putting it outside your system boundary, right? Maybe I'm not good at authorization and authentication. Maybe I am good at it and I just don't feel like doing it. It's effort that I don't want to have to spend. Well, I can use AWS Cognito or Okta or some other service to do that, protecting all that data and getting me the answer whether this person is supposed to be in the system or not, that's on them. They handle it, they handle the security around it. All I need to do is protect our communications back and forth, right? So that's transferring the threat. And the last one, which is actually very, very reasonable, especially if we're talking about the green corner of our, uh, our impact versus likelihood graph, is accept the risk. Say, you know what? Yes, state actors could get into my system. Guess what? It's a personal blog. Nobody cares. I can recreate it in a matter of hours. I'm not, it's not worth it, right? Cheeto security is plenty for me. All right. Now, if you want to learn more about threat modeling, right, we did it here talking about castles and going through it. It's that same thing you do when you're talking about systems, right? It really is no different in exercise. But if you want to learn more, there is a site out there called the Threat Modeling Manifesto. It's written very much the same style as the Agile Manifesto. Um, and they have a couple quotes that I'd like to pull out. One of them, we follow these principles that the best use of threat modeling is to improve security and privacy of, an, of a system through early and frequent analysis. That's important. We want to do it early. We want to shift left, right? Dave was just talking about this, right? More, the further you shift it to left, the better off you are in, in software operational performance, software delivery performance, sorry. But also, we want to do it through early and frequent analysis. This is not a one size fits all. It's not we do it only once, and we can forget it again forever. And it's also why I like talking about doing this back of the napkin threat not modeling, right? This is something you guys could do back at your organization as a tabletop exercise. Do it over lunch. Buy sandwiches. Everyone sits down, and for an hour, talk about the problems you have in your system, the risks, the likelihood of those happening, and hey, which ones can we address now? Which ones are important to worry about? Right? It does not need to be some huge, big thing, which leads us to the second one. It actually is under a section that says, these anti-patterns inhibit threat modeling, and it's called the hero threat modeler. Threat modeling does not depend on one's innate ability or unique mindset. Everyone can and should do it. All right. Um, if you actually want to get into threat modeling more than just the back of the napkin type stuff that I'm talking about, this is a great book. This is the one by Adam Shostock that I mentioned earlier, Threat Modeling, Designing for Security. He was one of the architects behind uh, Microsoft's uh, Secure Development Lifecycle, SDLC. Um, Microsoft pushes this framework, if you want to do more on it, called Stride. Has anyone ever heard of Stride? No one? All right. So Stride just is different ways to look to break down each of the components. It has some tools around it and some ways to actually draw out the, uh, the data flows of your system and figure out uh, which questions you should ask. But every component can be addressed. It's either susceptible to spoofing, pretending to be something or someone you're not, tampering, which is changing the data behind it, reputation, not being able to prove you wrote it, right? I did this or I absolutely did not do this. Information disclosure, which is just data leaks. Denial of service, making a system unusable, whether it's through a denial of service attack, I'm gonna flood the network, or I'm just gonna crash the system so that it's not available to people. And the classic elevation of privilege, getting permissions that you're not entitled to, right? That's Stride, and the tools that go along with Stride and the methodology of Stride just shows you how to figure out like if it's a database, Here's the components of Stride that really apply in this case that you should be addressing. And the tools that go around it basically help you make a checklist of things you should address and start applying likelihood and impact to. There are plenty of other ways to do it other than Stride. There's a free tool out there. Like I said, Stride has a free tool, but there's also the OWASP Threat Dragon, which is very similar. 
There's a couple other methodologies, pasta, keras, Threagile or Threadgel, I'm not sure. And there's a site there called Threat Modeler, which actually has a commercial tool associated with it. One of the neat things, it has a bunch of pre-made, pre-built threat models available if you give them your email and let them spam you. All right. Uh, I work for a company called Prazies. I'm very, very new there, barely know what we do. I've only been there for three weeks, and I've spent a bunch of that at conferences. Um, so just want to thank them for letting me be here. And lastly, key takeaways. Brainstorm your attacks and defenses. This is not, threat modeling does not need to be some big, super scientific, super in, uh, involved uh, security, invol uh, security uh, practice. It can just be brainstorming, attacks and defenses. Figure out what you're protecting. Balance your resources and time. Everyone can and should be threat modeling. You do it all the time anyway in your mind. You may as well sit down and do it as a tabletop exercise or an informal exercise or a formal exercise. And remember to iterate. Early and frequent analysis. And do we have time for questions? Yeah, absolutely. Let's see what kind of questions we got out there. I explained it so well, there's no questions. Yeah. Back over there. <laughs> I'm not serious now. Um, what, one of the things we struggled a lot with is tools to use to model threads. Sometimes we use a good old PowerPoint, good old spreadsheet. What tools do you use to model uh, these kind of thread models? We, there's okay. some more, more advanced ones, like they let you put the actual links to them. So the, the easy much. one to pick, the, easy, the, the question is what, what tools are we picking? The easiest one I found to pick is Stride uh, because it's fairly well known. Um, you know, it's kind of the old adage, you, no one ever fires you from buying, for buying IBM. Stride, Nowadays, no one's going to fire you for picking the tool that Microsoft puts out as part of the secure development lifecycle, right? If, you have, if you're using Stride, which tool do you use to model? Stride is both a framework and a tool. There's a free downloadable tool. Oh, nice. It used to be based on Visio, um, but if you use it to draw your data flow, your outline your system uh, as a picture, uh, you can hit a button and it'll generate a list of the questions to say, hey, this, this one, this component is susceptible to spoofing, tampering, and information disclosure. This one's uh, susceptible to all of them. This one is really only susceptible to elevation of privilege and it gives you a chance to start walking down and saying impact versus likelihood for each one of those and decide, okay, now we can kind of come up with a list of here's the things that are really important for us to fix. These are the things that we can wait until we have plenty of extra free time. That's awesome, thanks so much. Awesome, all right. Well, I think that's all can the time it? we got for now. Just one last thing. If you want to do this back, back at uh, your organization, you want to start it, one good way of doing it is just do a tabletop session to threat model a zombie apocalypse. Right? It's the Again, it's the same type of threat modeling, risk analysis. It's an easy one to do that people can get behind without getting wrapped up in, hey, I don't know enough security to do threat modeling. Sounds great. That sounds like a fun open space later today as well. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much.